Chapter 394 Norden Nord The Master Chief of the Eagle of Destruction led his soldiers along the edge of the fortress. Despite their massive Astartes bodies, they moved with silent precision. With the support of Barnard veterans, they managed to avoid most of the so-called patrols. The rotten eyeballs of these non-frontline troops had detection capabilities worse than those of mortals. Like the father of the gods in mythology who sacrificed his own eyes, the so-called omniscient and omnipotent Barnard was like a leading fish guiding a school through rapids, allowing the space marines to cross the most difficult passes with minimal effort. At that moment, the Master Chief of Destruction Eagle was preoccupied with another task. His mind was delving into the complex thoughts of Gene Dan's group. He saw many things, but he knew that some were false. He needed to find something real. As his body moved forward, his mind wandered, and he realized that the psychic wills here were very intriguing. Gene Dan, an alien race, had a technique to materialize memories as psychic energy. Such techniques had been used to destroy the human mind, but without the aid of special technological creations, this psychic energy was no more powerful than that of ordinary psychers. Among the chaotic and complex knowledge, he found a recurring memory that seemed insignificant. It wasn't about fighting skills, vehicle operation, tactical planning, or enemy analysis. Instead, it was the memory of a family of four living in a narrow room, eating simple artificial food with dilapidated furniture and tableware, and surviving in the dark interior of the hive. These memories spread like a malignant virus. For John Dan, such a virus was useless, but they all carried it subconsciously. The Master Chief quickly understood that the source of these memories was the medium he had speculated about. He initially thought this medium might be a special individual similar to a warrior bug, but reality revealed that it was just an ordinary person with latent psychic talents. Perhaps it was his brain? Maybe his soul? The Master Chief was unsure how to save this individual from Gene Dan, but he followed the psychic network and quickly found the gathering center. He might be the first individual to get so close to Gene Dan's core will, but he wasn't sure if it was the right thing to do. Once, this powerful race did not need a medium because of the existence of the will to kill. Now this race had to rely on humans, giving the Master Chief the opportunity to join this network and feel the intermingling of thoughts and the resonance of psychic energy. According to his description, this feeling was like no longer being lonely, full of peace and joy. However, he knew that if he truly entered it, everything about him would be wiped clean by those torrents, and he would become a part of it. Fortunately, he found the target before his willpower waned. The poor man was being overwhelmed by countless thoughts like a center. The Master Chief couldn't imagine what it felt like, but he couldn't help but sympathize with this poor man, especially after seeing his ordinary life. But he couldn't linger any longer, as he felt the master of Gene Dan's will approaching. The power of that individual was beyond his imagination. He quickly exited the connection, looked at the brothers who had entered the fortress, and said, It's at six o'clock, not far away. And I've learned how to cut off the connections between those things. If we encounter enemies we can't bypass, we'll kill them directly. His psychic talent was terrifying, surpassing human reliance. At the same time, he had found a way to approach the target silently. Barnard said uncertainly, Your rune magic is very strange. Is there really no problem? You must know that every bite needs time to be verified. The Master Chief replied, I have no choice. There is a poor man who needs me to save, that's all. Let's go. His kindness was touching, but this indifferent universe was not so kind. As he approached Nord's will, Dan Beck, aim aware of his existence. This powerful spiritual being had the ability to directly detain the Master Chief's will, but it did not take action. It realized that although Nord Nord, a mortal, had good potential psychic talents, he was not considered a psychic in the end. The limitations of the mortal body were also there. Before he really had any contact with the subspace, this mortal could barely use it. But the librarian of the Destruction Eagle was different. Dan understood how powerful this individual was. Even an ordinary complete body of Gene Dan could not compare to his spiritual power. That kind of power made it salivate. If it could get this Astartes body, Rang Dan, who was in the next nest, 
could get a channel comparable to his own main body. Greed outweighed the danger, and it could accept the failure of its efforts because it had time and opportunity. But a body like this only came once in a lifetime, for which it could sacrifice that mortal human being, so it let the master chief go. The usually smart and alert sergeant didn't feel anything was wrong, or in other words, he didn't want this risk to ruin their plan. At this moment, after he used his psychic energy to block the patrol team's passage, the monsters showed confusion and helplessness. He could imagine that the feeling might be similar to pulling a fish out of the water. Those monsters quickly became vigilant, but lost their collective will. These monsters were no longer powerful and experienced warriors, but just transformed human corpses with no physical strength. After the opening scene where Barnard used a shotgun to instantly turn the opponent into flesh, the soldiers of the Destruction Eagle used chain swords and explosive bombs to start a massacre. At the same time, Nord was lying on a soft bed, just as he always did, except that a bodyguard composed of rotten Imperial loyal heirs, stormtroopers, and Red Corsair Astartes warriors guarded his door, unaware of the danger. But he wanted to sleep, and when he closed his eyes, his mind was no longer dark and sleepy. Instead, the tens of thousands of huge Rangdan split bodies and the creatures he called Oracle Worms kept calling his voice. In an instant, he saw a lot of knowledge, memories, and the scenes that were happening now. He could no longer dream, but when he closed his eyes and cleared his mind, he was living in a dream. He saw himself turning into a powerful space warrior, crushing human heads with his fingers, and transforming into a heavily armed warrior walking through the woods. A few days ago, he had never seen the truly vast world. He saw huge stars hanging on the endless horizon, that was so vast that it seemed to suck him in, an unknown planet was looking at him with giant light blue pupils. Sometimes he turned into a woman, standing in the hall of an unknown college, with his body upright and his hands behind his back, standing straight up, letting the person in front of him dressed as a senior imperial officer, observe which unit he would be selected into. Finally, he saw his master, a faceless lord wearing black robes, questioning him silently. Why haven't you taken down the imperial guard yet? Why haven't you infected Alan Bear yet? Why haven't you completed my mission yet? His forehead was constantly sweating, and his body couldn't help but twitch. He wanted to open his eyes, but he felt like his body couldn't move. His whole body was trembling, but those things were all false memories in a half-dream and half-awake state. A large amount of information hit his head, and he struggled to process it all. Finally, he got up from the bed in shock. What troubled him the most wasn't the accusations made by his emperor or the other unsettling events, but the fact that he hadn't rested for three days and yet didn't feel a trace of sleepiness. He didn't even realize he was hungry until soldiers pushed a dining cart outside his door. The orderly imitators he saw were crafted according to his memory, and even the faces of the officers were as close as possible, making him feel constantly under surveillance. They brought him everything he might need, from the toilet to new clothes, food, and drinks, even when he didn't feel the need for them. On the plate were natural wheat bread, artificial eggs, and Glomon bacon. Just by looking at the portion size, it was clear it was at the level of a school-level officer in the Imperial Guard. There were also a large number of seized snacks and dried fruits, but he didn't feel hunger or craving. His thoughts were like transparent glass windows, like a pipe through which countless things passed, but nothing stayed behind. His fragile life was being destroyed by the endless exchange of information. As he tasted the eggs and bacon with his fork, he tried to ignore the reality that he was merely a prop, not as smart as he once thought. He told himself it was all for the emperor, but when his tongue touched the food that was supposed to be greasy and fragrant, it felt vague and tasteless. The delicious food he once dreamed of now tasted like chewing wax. His brain had been penetrated by worms, and his taste experience had been rendered useless. Humans are complex creatures, especially their taste systems, which are considered the most complex in the galaxy. This complexity has destined mankind to be a greedy and exploratory race. 
Even at the end of 40,000 years of this cruel civilization, countless people in the Empire tirelessly explore the dark edges of the galaxy for a touch of delicious food. For Nord, hunger and poverty had been constant companions in his not-so-long life. Eating was almost the most important ritual for him. If people don't eat and don't enjoy eating, human nature begins to change. As a living being, the most important function is to actively look for food. At this moment, Nord felt his life fragmenting, his thoughts becoming thousands of independent individuals, and his sense of touch as a human being dissipating. Was he still himself? When he recalled his family, sister, relatives, and the people he valued, he also thought about the Inquisition. If he failed, they would catch them. Countless pieces of knowledge in his head told him how the Imperial Inquisition dealt with traitorous relatives like him. He saw his sister turn into a servitor, working endlessly, and his parents being tortured and shot, then thrown into the factory of the Hive City, becoming food for others. During his short and painful stay, he asked himself again and again if there was any way back. The answer was no. He could only conquer this place and obey the Emperor. A large amount of knowledge had transformed him from an ignorant person to someone who knew many secrets. He already knew that the creature he was facing was definitely not the master of mankind, but he had no way back. After his meal, he had to face the increasingly anxious situation of the war. Countless intelligence reports informed him of the war's severity. The Imperial Guard's strong resistance was ongoing. Lemanus had become the bottom line of the defense line. Heavy tanks covered the infantry as they tried to capture Jean. Dan stood amidst the chaos, the relentless bombardment of heavy artillery echoing around him. The sheer destruction was terrifying, even more so than the Emperor's Baneblade, that colossal super-heavy tank which moved like a fortress across the battlefield. Its mortar grenades could turn mortals into nothing but mud and even break the hearts of space marines. Time and again, they broke through the front lines, only to be held back by the poison blades. They lacked the heavy firepower and long-term supplies needed for sustained positional battles against the remaining Astartes of the Red Corsairs. The massive loss of resources was becoming a serious burden on the front line. Dan knew he had to organize a high-intensity breakthrough to completely contain the remaining Red Corsairs Astartes, their mortal servants, and the numerous land raiders. This was one of the few opportunities he had left. He began to tighten the battle line, receiving intel agents about the Empire Astartes breaking through the defense line. Returning to defense became one of his few viable options. But then, a violent burst of gunfire erupted at his door. He recognized the sound, explosive bombs. Someone had breached the fortress defenses. Dan quickly gathered most of the nearby soldiers, his collective consciousness growing stronger. He couldn't understand why his companions hadn't alerted him immediately. Then he heard the howling of wolves, a sound that sent chills down his spine. He had never encountered a wild beast before, despite his vast knowledge. His mortal brain, heavily modified by worms, was using all its capacity to increase psychic energy throughput, making him even more susceptible to the control of the Lord of Rangdan. This was his most vulnerable moment. Yet amidst the chaos, he felt a strange sense of peace, a peace that came from the thought of escaping the pain and contradictions of his false life, accepting the trial, suffering in life, and finding rest in death. Suddenly, a sharp pain pierced his head, and his consciousness was swiftly replaced by another presence. A person with unsettling purple spiritual energy in their eyes took over. Like a puppet, Dan's body moved under this new control. With a strange smile, he awaited his next prey, a psychic astart. Chapter 3 and 95, The Death of the Eagle The corridor was shrouded in darkness, a deliberate choice by Jean Dan, who saw no need for light. The Astartes of the Red Corsairs could see perfectly well in the dark, their complex psychic network transmitting visual information to the mortals under their control. Despite this, there was no hierarchy among them. Jean Dan, who controlled them, was on the same level, though their roles and responsibilities varied. This often meant that mortals had to rely on the space warriors, even after being controlled by Jean Dan and turned into puppets. The flickering Prometheum lamps were the last mercy Jean Dan left for the fragile mortal bodies. However, to conserve vital fuel, 
not enough lumen globes were installed in many places. This lack of light provided the Eagle of Destruction with a crucial opportunity. The Master Chief of the Eagle of Destruction suddenly reached out from a corner, grabbing an enemy's throat and using a tactical dagger to kill the Red Corsair Astartes leading the patrol. Decapitating the Astartes plunged the corridor into darkness for Jean Dan's forces. Without the Astartes, the mortals faced only explosive bombs and death. Dozens of rapid Kraken bombs flew by, leaving the metal corridor littered with broken flesh. Using the spiritual Fenrir wolf, they gathered the various pieces of meat and threw them into an open space. The worms crawling inside the flesh were the reason the mortals could still move. After being cut off by the Master Chief, they fell into irreversible chaos, forgetting to escape and squirming like primitive animals. Their intelligence was a false construct, a result of their spiritual connection. Barnard's power armor stepped hard, causing a collision and explosion of liquid and flesh in the narrow space. The false intelligence turned into a ball of dead flesh. Despite Jean Dan's terrible puncture and fire resistance, they were useless against crushing. As they advanced, most of the warriors were optimistic, except for Barnard, who whispered, The hunting went too well, boy. This is not a good omen. Only when hunting in the cold wind and difficulty will the prey obtained be a gift from Russ, especially when we are pulsating with such an ancient and huge beast. His words made sense, but the Master Chief was already focused. He could feel the surging spiritual energy deep in the corridor ahead. Without hesitation, he reached out and touched the heavy iron door. The next moment, he was repelled by strong spiritual energy, and his falcon sword buzzed and trembled. The iron door flew off its hinges, twisted and curved like feathers and iron, killing several battle brothers. The Master Chief slipped through the gap in the door like a cat, his long sword cutting a path. He saw a figure swelling abnormally, surrounded by strange spiritual energy resembling a demon or Jean Dan. The Master Chief was already disgusted by the alien's evil actions, but now he couldn't describe his emotions. Amidst the twisted flesh and the twisted flesh and the sound of mortal souls pleading, he slashed with his long sword. Jean Dan stood there, a psychic shield glowing with faint blue light, absorbing most of the attack. Barnard yelled, What kind of monster is this? It stinks more than the sea dragon, is more powerful than the rune priest, and is more twisted than the devil. He raised his shotgun and fired. The sea dragon's teeth, like sharp swords, pierced the monster's heart but didn't explode. Strong spiritual energy bound the projectile, and then he threw it towards the space marines like a grenade. Many brothers, including Barnard, hurriedly prostrated themselves. In the next second, countless small pressures dissipated. If this narrow place were suddenly pressurized, the armor of the brothers who followed them would burst instantly. Only Barnard, a veteran who knew how to dodge the fangs, could rely on his skills and use special breathing techniques to mitigate the attack. In any case, the Master Chief was ordering the soldiers to retreat through internal communication. This enemy was more powerful than he had imagined. This was not a beast at the end of the war, but a more crazed and twisted existence. The Space Marines began to retreat from the fortress in an orderly manner, forming a defensive line to help the Master Chief guard against subsequent alien attacks. Despite the outcome, only the old wolf Barnard and the Master Chief of Destruction remained, confronting this demon. An evil wind blew past the monster, and the rough air carried an inexplicable stench. Just by looking at it, the willpower of mortals could be torn apart. The powerful force of the Supreme Heaven inspired both fear and worship. However, its opponents were not mortals, but the powerful Astartes. A slash, faster than any mortal could achieve, came towards it again. This time, the sword's edge burned with fierce flames, capable of tearing apart all impurities. The flames came from a silver and ruthless sun, an ancient and powerful entity, a unique god of mankind. When their spiritual energies collided, the flames showed destructive power beyond expectations, instantly tearing apart the spiritual energy that Dan was proud of. The blade passed by, and its shoulder fell away but it was not flesh and blood, but a mass of disordered worms. These worms quickly healed Dan's body. In the next second, the old wolf shot at the group of worms, and Hylong's fangs tore them apart, turning them into fleshy foam. Dan's body let out a heart-rending roar, as if someone had cut off his arm. 
The unpleasant howling echoed throughout the corridor, and four ferocious Fenrir dogs followed closely, biting into Dan's body. However, the beasts were torn apart by a large number of worms. Barnard listened with heartache to the sound of his old friends dying. He raised his weapon, ready to face the formidable enemy. One more time, kid. Let's chip away at it until it's over, Barnard shouted. At the end of their extreme, the chief raised his weapon again, cutting through the shield like a natural brother, and fired an explosive bomb. The next second, a mud-like blood splatter exploded from Dan's chest. This cooperation caused the monster great trauma, but Dan didn't care. Its body was a medium composed of a large number of souls of its kind and mortals. Compared to the so-called injuries, it cared more about destroying the Eagle Sergeant's body. A vicious plan had already formed in its mind. When Sergeant Destruction Eagle cut its shield again, it deliberately showed weakness, pretending that its spiritual power was declining. But it was not actually that weak. The Master Chief was subconsciously tricked. After all, losing so many bodies is a very serious matter in the eyes of humans. When he repeated this fighting style again and again, his blade was suddenly caught, and countless worms followed the sword and climbed up. Dan's terrifying psychic energy extinguished the flames. This was the first time the Master Chief encountered such a situation. It was not that the Emperor's power was not strong enough, but that he could not burn more of his own psychic energy as fuel to supply this powerful spell. As a space warrior, his abilities should be far beyond those of ordinary people, but when, faced with the abilities gifted by the Emperor, he felt utterly powerless. When countless worms used their spiritual energy to dismantle his defensive stance, that sense of powerlessness reached its peak. He was going to die. Yet, he hated being controlled by aliens more than he feared dying in battle. But he had no choice. He saw his armor being drilled by worms, his body rotting, and himself becoming an enemy of the Empire. The powerful psychic prophecy caused these fragments to flash in his mind, making him sick and causing him to collapse. There was no doubt that he had become the very thing he least wanted to be. How many minutes could he retain his will before those worms penetrated his skin and rotted his black armor? This period of time was as terrifying as torture. Suddenly, his consciousness heard shouting, like a wolf's howl. The next says, Econd, a bomb penetrated Jean Dan's heart. The strong explosion and high pressure shocked the sergeant. When the commander pushed him away, his breastplate shattered into pieces, and his helmet was in tatters, revealing the black carapace on his chest and the sergeant's handsome face. This incident also angered Jean Dan. The worm saw its dream shattered and couldn't help but look at the culprit who destroyed everything. The wolves that killed them thousands of years ago were still destroying its plans. This grudge had existed since the Emperor was still alive and continued intermittently to this day. Jean Dan used his spiritual energy to grab the old wolf's throat. At this moment, he felt his life force slipping away and his will bending. The veteran's spine curved. The force that could kill space marines bent him. The immense power turned Barnard into an L-shape and blood flowed from his empty eyes. The Sergeant of the Destruction Eagle watched all this, although Barnard only had a smile of relief on his face. He had dedicated his whole life to the Empire and lived up to the name of Russ, but the Sergeant Chief only felt the heartbreaking pain of losing his brother. The next moment, the Falcon Sword burned like never before. If he usually dispatched the Emperor's flames, it was equivalent to surrounding the blade with a circle of blue flames. At this moment, his sword had completely turned into a blazing fire, as if it was burning with exaggerated scarlet flaming horns. The entire corridor burned so brightly that Jean Dan couldn't help but feel fear. It didn't even have time to consume Barnard's body before it was penetrated by the sharp blade of the Master Chief. At this moment, this man was no longer an Astartes. To be precise, he had lost his mind due to injury and anger. The name of the individual who represented him could not be verified, but at this moment, the Master Chief's face was extremely calm and indifferent, reminiscent of towering sculptures that dominate cities large and small across the Empire. Jean Dan asked in great fear, Who are you? The Master Chief responded coldly, You shouldn't live here, heretic. His pupils turned into a strange blue and silver intersecting light, 
and at the same time, flames engulfed Dan's body. In the endless flames, this monster that could withstand tens of thousands of degrees of heat turned into dust and ashes. The Master Chief collapsed to the ground. At this moment, only death remained in the entire corridor. Endless death. The endless waves on the battlefield began to collapse. Their attacks became chaotic, and many began to stand in a daze. The bombings of the Imperial Guard and the assaults of soldiers quickly recaptured many positions. In less than half a day, the fortress was once again recaptured. When the Imperial Guard completely cleared out the aliens, the Red Pirates also retreated early. In any case, the Imperial Guard achieved a comprehensive victory in this war, with the invaluable help of the Space Wolves. Alan Baer received unsettling news after the war. The Master Chief of the Destruction Eagle now resembled an old man, with white and gray hair and constant wrinkles. He could only continue living in a stagnant state. The Chief Physician and the Apothecary of the Doom Eagle were helpless, and the only diagnosis came from a Space Wolf Rune Priest. Those who bear the light of the Silver Sun need to burn themselves as fuel. Meanwhile, in the Lower Nest, the powerful Dan returned to its body, feeling extremely weak. The Emperor's flames had burned away much of it, and its connection with the will of extermination in the Supreme Heaven had become vague. Such injuries were more terrible than any physical attack, as Dan, a psychic creature cluster, relied on its willpower to exist in the network of connections in the Supreme Heaven, rather than a powerful body or many compatriots. This was why the Empire had once completely eradicated this group of monsters. The behemoth trembled in its palace, covering its head. A burning flame grew strong, air and stronger within it. This was not its own power, but that of a unique and terrifying ancient god. Unable to accept these existences, the behemoth reached a critical point. Its entire body ignited and turned into a ball of silver flames, dissipating from this world. On the red pirate flagship approaching Engiliport, the old wizard lord awoke from meditation. He felt his connection with the worm had been severed. The plan of the Lord of Change had been thwarted. Though disappointed, he knew Angeli's spaceport was very close. He needed time and opportunity. Huron was a stubborn and unyielding obstacle, which frustrated him. But he had to admit that in the current situation, Huron was the last trump card of the Lord of Change. The plan to tear the Empire apart was about to begin. If control of the Great Whirlpool area could not be seized, the Empire would gain precious time. He realized that if this attack failed, the Empire would have another thousand years to continue its existence. The Supreme Heaven's plan to invade the real universe and the war to destroy Cadia would have to be postponed. This was intolerable to him. He looked at the information in front of him and read it silently. The last wall is the Astra Militarum? The Imperial Guard? His dry fingers waved casually over the text, then suddenly stopped. He focused on a name and read it aloud. Alan Bear? Chapter 396 The Last Enemy The decisive battle with Huron Bordelow's detection matrix was buzzing. For hours, it had been sending vague warnings to the loyalists of the Empire. This ancient Sheen's spirit was more sensitive and powerful than its counterparts. However, the comrades who could understand its warnings, such as the former captain and the commander of the Imperial Guard, were no longer with her. At the same time, Alan Bear and other warriors who had tirelessly expanded the Empire's territory, like the Scotty 4th Regiment or the Eagles of Destruction, were still suffering. The Master Chief was not dead, but he was no longer capable of fighting. For a space warrior, this was akin to death. Some suggested placing him into the coffin of the Dreadnought Mecca so he could continue to serve the Empire. However, the pain of such a fate was beyond normal endurance, so they decided to wait for the Master Chief to wake up before making any decisions. A pessimistic gloom hung over the officers of the entire fortress, and the deep void platform became bleak. Meanwhile, the Scotty 4th Regiment needed to guard and control the remnants of the Red Pirates. The Imperial Guard could not escape, and the Red Pirates' King seized this opportunity, launching a long-planned assault with elite combat power and a heavy flagship. Tens of millions of kilometers away, the Red Pirates' warships had gathered. They were eager for the war to begin, to save their brothers, and to settle their scores with the Scotty people. The Centurion and the heavy Astartes landing group 
composed of raiders, were preparing to descend and rescue their brothers. At the same time, Huron was ready to awaken and settle past grudges with his mortal enemy, Alan Bear. The Ghost of Destruction was traveling alone through the void. This clever and bold Lord of Destruction decided to use a highly maneuverable battle barge to directly destroy the super-heavy volcanic cannon that the Astra Militarum was so proud of. He was not a fool. The gods were aiding him, and a strange warp storm slowly covered the area. Weird things were happening in the Hive City. Women gave birth to inhuman beast children, minced meat grew out of the pipes in the nest, and twisted beasts began to mutate. A gust of subspace wind blew through this metal world. The thick fine gold could resist the most terrible bombardment, but it could not withstand the power from the highest heaven. The abnormal fluctuations made the psychers start to chatter. At the same time, the Red Pirate's fleet was approaching. A large number of molten torpedoes and light spears were bombarding Anguli Port with large-scale firepower. Although they could not paralyze the void shield of the planetary fortress, they created a good fire cover effect and made naked eye detection unreliable. Divination detection, such as the Oriole, was destroyed by subspace fluctuations, showing abnormal garbled codes. The volcano cannon was a weapon that required high accuracy, especially in void battles with a target distance of 10,000 kilometers. The Red Pirates now knew the Empire's tactics very well. Such an action forced the Empire into another battleship battle. Alan Bear looked at the sudden frontline report with a frozen expression. He had thought the war was about to end and was entering a rest stage. The sudden change disrupted everything. In the command room of Engili Port, what he had mastered was no longer in his grasp. He asked the former captain, the current owner of Engili Spaceport, and the last generation of the Feng family, a crucial question. If you fire the volcano cannon, how accurate is it? The captain replied. Less than 20%. Fire, Alan Bear commanded without hesitation. He would try even if the chance was only 1%. The dark ghost of destruction in the void was like a phantom. The gods were protecting it, making the Imperial Guard's efforts seem futile. The artillery fire continued, but it was unable to hit its target. A position around it blocked the artillery fire. When the volcano can, non-shot came, intense heat grazed its periphery and instantly overloaded its void shield. For the Red Pirates, this might have been a blessing in disguise. The heat only turned a very small part of the hull's exterior into molten iron, which then scattered into the void. However, the intense heat quickly raised the temperature of the metal, instantly cooking the mortals inside. They lost thousands of people, but it was not fatal. The ghost of destruction continued to move forward, bearing a long red wound on its right side. The volcano cannon was reloaded and fired again. The gunner was considered the best and most professional in the entire star region, supported by dozens of mechanical sages and hundreds of Ministry of Internal Affairs employees who helped calculate the interference in subspace. Despite their efforts, the shot still deviated under the optical blur of the observation scope. At this moment, a large amount of resources equivalent to several battleships were expended. Rare synthetic elements were used to quickly dissipate heat. Another shot was fired, but there was not enough time. Several pitch-black Hellclaw landing pods ejected from the launch port on the outside of the barge and struck two places on the fortress's exterior. Most of the rescue efforts were unnecessary. The resolute Lord of the Red Pirates used a long-planned tactic to tear apart Angeli's heavy defenses and sharpest spears. The war was not a simple fight, but a complex game of chess. The governor of the port of Njili, a former captain of Bordero, made an angry report. The enemy has landed on the outer armor. Observers indicate they are installing something. It's a few terminators of the traitorous space marines who came out of the airdrop bay. They, a violent tremor shook the command point, which was very close to the exterior. To lay fewer pipelines and reduce weapon delay, Alan Bear felt what the other side had done. They used explosives to destroy the Empire's spear, the muzzle of the volcano cannon. One of the most terrifying space-based weapons in the history of the Empire was now a ball of scrap metal. Yet, Alan Bear's heart was unexpectedly calm. After all, it was his appearance that allowed this behemoth to be produced by the Empire, 
so he felt responsible for the misuse of such weapons. He was even a little grateful to the Lord of the Red Pirates for his help. Although the extermination order still existed in all aspects of the Empire, and the heavy volcano cannon only gave the Empire one more option, he did not want the two giant beasts he created to be used for anything other than protecting the thousands of mortals in the Empire. He couldn't guarantee whether these two monsters would target innocent people after his short life was over. Alan Bear nodded indifferently. They want close combat and battleship combat. They are afraid of the power of the volcano cannon. So let's give them what they want. Captain, we are going to board the ship again. The captain showed a happy expression. Even though he was a noble and governor, the lord of countless people, he could not suppress his emotions at this moment. He seemed calm, even at ease. Rather than being the lord of countless people, he preferred to be a pioneer on Bordeaux, as if his cells were isolating him to enjoy the experience of pioneering and living without a fixed place. Even though he was a born adventurer, the captain of Bordero had more than once praised Alan Bear for his terrifying adaptability in void travel. He did not resist boarding the ship. In fact, he was a little excited. Alan Bear felt a deep sense of contentment. He was a soldier, a sailor, and a leader. When he arrived at the starport, stepped onto the bridge of the Bordello once more, and touched her humming engine, he understood why the captain was so obsessed with this ship. The symphony of engines and monitors, the opening of the cogitator servitor, and the hiss of steam, all of it made the captain's throne on the bridge shine brightly, polished by the sailors. From the carved skull to the he spread winged sky eagle atop the huge throne, Alan Bear once again invited the captain on board. Come on, this is your own paradise, he said. The captain was flattered. After two years away, the place seemed quite unfamiliar. Yet, when he sat at his command point, it felt as if he had been swimming in the Gulf of Damocles just yesterday. Returning to his old post with the same enemies, he felt his heart beat in sync with the machine's soul. He shouted, Let's go! The roar of the plasma engine echoed through the starport like a song. With the joint efforts of countless sailors and officers and the labor of tens of thousands, the behemoth left the port. The Red Pirate's flagship waved as if it had been waiting for a long time. The battle group, composed of the Darrow and the Imperial Navy, mirrored the battle barge group, led by the Ghost of Destruction, outside the massive void platform of Engeli Port. Looking out through the battleship's window, the flickering lights marked the enemy's position, like stars in the dark night sky. But unlike the stars, these lights represented death. Yet, Alan Bear felt no fear. He looked at the Oriol and spoke like an experienced sailor. The time will be just as it was when we set out, my friend. The bridge was now much emptier. Sergeant Destruction Eagle was not there, nor was Boy Letling, the second lieutenant, Inquisitor Nova, or the brothers he was familiar with. Only the major families who managed the interior of the battleship and worked diligently remained. From the fire controller family to the information family, from the navigator to the astropath, from the engine master to the technology prophet, these people were with him. Together, they would face the boundless and cruel void. But Alan Bear couldn't help but feel lonely. He understood that this was just the beginning. The captain would eventually leave, and the 4th Scotty Regiment would be disbanded. The regiment's establishment was already in jeopardy, and the number of soldiers was no longer sufficient to maintain it. Even so, it was hard to imagine that this Imperial Infantry Regiment had been fighting for more than ten years. He was used to being alone. He knew that the Letling boys would go to various parts of the galaxy to look for ingredients. He knew that the Katachan Sergeant would take all the red scarves and Katachan swords in the Katachan Regiment to search for the world of death, his second home planet, Katachan, where he would once again complete his test as a warrior and return the spirit of the dead Lieutenant Colonel Katachan to his homeland. The Destruction Eagle would be stationed, but the Master Chief would probably die. Inquisitor Nova would have to travel to various parts of the galaxy to fulfill his responsibilities, an indescribable amount of responsibilities. The Second Lieutenant would become a general and continue to work hard for the Empire. 
the chief of staff would have to travel across the galaxy until he stopped to worship on Terra. Everyone had their own dreams, but they were delayed by this cruel world. Although it was difficult to realize their dreams, Alan Bear would fight for the brothers he knew without hesitation. He looked at the familiar, densely packed red dots on the Oriole, and it was hard to imagine that his end and starting point were against the same enemy. In this era, those heretics angered and annoyed him time and time again, and they had not stopped. Alan Bear felt a wave of relief wash over him. The task ahead was daunting, but he knew that defeating Huron would bring a precious and valuable peace to this corner of the universe, at least for the span of a mortal lifetime. As he listened to the soldiers on the communication channel, their voices filled with complaints about the monsters emerging from the lower decks due to subspace fluctuations, he also heard the engine crew working tirelessly to activate the heart of the battleship. In this vast universe, within the sprawling empire, and among the countless mortals, Alan was profoundly grateful that he was as not one of them. If he were a mere mortal, the cost of survival for this star would be immeasurably higher. He activated his communicator. Officers, crew, and sailors of Bordero, I am Alan Bear, Lord Commander of Skadi, former Sun Lord, Warlord of the Imperial Guard, Honorary Admiral of the Imperial Navy, Lord of the Fortress World of Skadi, Pangia Commander of the Subsector, Commander in Chief of Pangia, Senior Official of the Ministry of Munitions, and the man who forged the alliance between the stars. The entire channel fell silent, the only sound being the echo of Alan's voice. He continued, You are the thousands who have brought continuous life to the Empire. You are the core of my success. Now we face the final battle. If we can kill the black-hearted king and the traitor Huron, the Empire will have peace for thousands of years. If we fail, the next destruction will be upon us, he said with unwavering resolve. Cadia! Those traitors will form an alliance with the Chaos Warmaster, and relying on the Ark of Omen and the power gained from recuperating in the Maelstrom will attack the strongest fortress of the human empire. If we fail, the Eye of Terror in Cadia may suffer irreversible damage. If we succeed, the human empire can survive the next millennium safely. Now, fire your torches at the enemy, for the sake of the Imperium, for the sake of the Emperor. Alan's voice rang out with finality. This is the end of the Scotties, and this is the end of the Bordero. The battleship erupted into a flurry of activity, the jumbled voices of the crew converging into a unified chant. For the Emperor! Tens of thousands of artillery pieces fired at the distant light spots with incredible speed. The Empire's powerful battleships clashed with the core flagship of the Red Pirates, the void shields shimmering, macro cannons blazing, and light spears piercing through the darkness, converging into a distant and terrifying star. In this dark 41st millennium, no amount of propaganda could truly appease the people. The world was as bleak as they said, filled with silence and unending nightmares. If there was one truth that could describe this world, it was a simple, numbing reality. The battle would last forever. Chapter 397, Shadow of Subspace On the ghost of destruction, Huron gazed at his mortal enemy. He was much stronger than those weaklings, but mortals could withstand the full blows of the Red Pirates time and time again. Besides the attacker's disadvantage in defense, the Red Pirates were unable to go out in full force. Huron needed to be wary of the enemies of Chaos and be prepared to deal with pirates who might betray him at any time. There were also the incessant evil whispers muttering tempting proposals in his ears. Even though this was his flagship, it felt like a needle piercing his heart. Huron looked at the various glowing cannons on the battle line and twirled his pet's chin with interest. The mutated parrot, Hadmaria, purred like a kitten, despite its unsettling appearance with rotten eyeballs and colorful feathers. Huron now turned to his loyal lieutenant. Has the Centurion team breached the fortress? The adjutant nodded. Yes, my lord. They are now searching for Garrod in the upper lair. They will try to be faster than the Space Wolves and take those people away before we can leave. Huron sat on the battleship throne made of metal and death. He looked at the Imperial Navy's fleet. There were no battle barges of the Destruction Ghost and the Space Wolves, although the Emperor-class battleships or the Mars-class cruisers posed some threat. However, 
after the Imperial Navy lost a large number of Sidewinder-class destroyers, relying solely on frigates and cruiser groups was not a significant threat to his legion. Take Garrett away? No, that's not enough. I want to win. Greed flashed in his eyes. The value of a wealthy empire's deep space orbit far exceeds that of an ordinary non-technological or rare resource empire world. At the same time, it would be easier to annihilate the Imperial Navy here and capture the fortress world of Scotty. However, we now have to get close to Engjili port and prepare for the evacuation of that useless Garrod. The Star Language Choir has been exhausted due to his continuous communication, and he actually abandoned the base directly. When he returns, I need to prevent him from going to the front line again. Huron's anger rarely surfaced. Although he was a Dark Lord, his personality was quite gentle, and he was more tolerant towards those who were capable. But this time, he was completely enraged. His lieutenant saw this side of Huron for the first time. The Lord exuded a strange aura, and as his emotions were aroused, the many blessings given to him by the evil power became ready to be used. It felt like witnessing a war titan ready to fire at any time, and you were bound to its trajectory. Even the adjutant, a veteran of the Badab War, couldn't help but sweat at this moment. In the short time gap that seemed to have passed thousands of years, he tremblingly mustered up the courage to fulfill his responsibilities. My lord, it is unlikely that we will approach Angili port now. The flagship of the Imperial Navy is still there. He felt dizzy. Even so, his willpower was amazing. The angry Huron also noticed what was wrong with the poor guy at this moment. He relaxed his attitude and said indifferently, Let Goran Sulet handle it, as the power given to us by the gods, he is also part of it. Don't give him any privileges. Ask him to ensure the destruction ghost reaches its destination smoothly and let us get close to Engeli port by any means necessary. The adjutant replied tremblingly, Yes, sir. This order soon arrived in front of Goran Sulet, who was fanning the wind of subspace in his room. The mortal herald who stepped into the room was pinched by an invisible force after reciting Huron's words and died instantly. The body split into two parts like a toy, while Garan Sulet just closed his eyes and raised his arms high. At this moment, the entire room was filled with all kinds of runes and evil decorations. Except for the terrifying number of cabinets and the various evil crystals placed on them, there is only one seat for real daily necessities. This place is Garo, and Sulit's bedroom, and it is hard to imagine how a person could live here. An eight-pointed star is painted on the floor, and bottles, jars, and candles cover every available surface. The disorderly wind of subspace is expanding. Garen uses all of himself to turn into a channel, allowing the power of the supreme heaven to tear apart the barrier of the real universe bit by bit. Every psyker witnesses the method and appearance of the power of subspace differently. For Garen Sulet, those manifestations are crystals. Colorful crystals flickered on the cabinet. There was no obvious source of power input or lighting. But at this moment, those crystals began to flicker in an orderly manner, like some weird script. It was as if the crystals had become huge living entities, which was terrifying. Garen Sulet looked at those rays of light, those distorted rays of light reflected in his old pupils, and he said with a smile, Yes, yes, I will punish those mortals who steal your sculptures, and I will also complete Huron's great achievements. But you also need to give me more. My meager spiritual power is far from enough to affect so many battleships. After he finished speaking, the light of the crystals began to flicker faster. Garen Sulet's expression suddenly turned grim, and he curled up on the ground, crying out, No, no, too much, I was wrong, I am not worthy of your great power. His body began to twist continuously, and the pale white gelatinous skin that was the signature of the chaos egg emerged. He kept begging for mercy, and at the same time, his spiritual energy and willpower crazily resisted the terrifying power from the subspace. This lasted for five minutes. When he finally got up weakly, he had obtained what he wanted, but the price was that his body was severely mutated, looking like a pale and terrifying alien. He regretted his recklessness and then covered his skin with special powder to make himself look normal. However, his dark, pupilless eyes made him look like a real monster. He muttered, At least I can interfere with them. He waved his staff, and a wind of magic that was so beautiful 
it was almost physical, blew through the entire area. For psychers, this feeling was extremely uncomfortable. Even the astropath and navigator of the Red Pirates saw countless visions and heard whispers while their servants were torn apart by their furious magic. Under today's hurricane, even the least talented mortals showed a trace of spiritual talent. Some people found that their bodies were burning, some could start to hear the voices of others, and some could suddenly change their muscles. But the price was that they couldn't control those sudden abilities. What followed was not strength, but a large number of spontaneous combustion incidents of the human body, severe muscle trauma, or being directly shocked by a large number of sounds and turning into madmen. Even some people who had no psychic talent were implicated to death. However, on Huron's ship, mainly composed of space marines, under their coercive control, the riots came and went quickly. On the contrary, in the Imperial Navy, which is dominated by mortals, such riots occurred in various cargo terminals, lower decks, and even on the command bridge. It was an absolute nightmare. Even if the Bordero had a solid machine soul and the best sailors, it would be difficult to avoid this. When the Purple Hurricane came over, Alan Bayer was sensitive and felt uncomfortable for the first time. Then, a warning from the Psyker came through the communicator, suddenly shouted by the navigator who was connected to the ship's sensors at all times. Purple, purple everywhere, oh my god! Don't come here, Emperor, replied the ship's steward. Captain, the sound array system of the navigation sanctuary is offline. No one answered, the line is normal. The machine spirit is likely functioning normally, but the engine prophet reported abnormal fluctuations. They are conducting an emergency appeasement ritual, Alan Bayer inquired. How are the astropaths? The steward rep lied. The choir is currently stable, but they have warned us of strange sounds pulsating in the warp. Should we retreat and leave this area? The captain retorted. Absolutely not. We must prevent the Red Pirates from entering Engelly Port at all costs. Notify the fire control teams to open fire with full strength and destroy the Red Pirate's flagship before the system completely collapses. His emotions twisted like a whirlpool. Ilam Bear realized the impossibility of his order. Increasing the pressure on the fire control teams would only cause the area to collapse faster. He cursed under his breath. I have taken control of the Bordero in the name of the Commander-in-Chief of the Pangaea subsector. Captain, your order just now is leading us into the abyss. Alan Bayer's voice was like the ethereal holy word of the emperor, which stunned the captain. He then regained his composure, reflecting on his impulsive decision. How could a moon-class ship quickly destroy a barge with shields comparable to those of a battleship? He looked regretfully at the rudder in front of him and said, as if repenting, O oh, Bordero, I have betrayed your trust in me. Even the damn warp magic shouldn't have made me do this. Alan Byer, my lord, thank you. Alan Byer's face remained stern, though he was also disturbed. In front of him were the shadows of his brothers, leaving one by one. Those phantom sounds seemed real. If he hadn't known he was on the battleship, he might have believed it. Now he saw his friends leaving after the war, and he heard a gentle voice saying that as long as they followed its plan, they could live better lives and have more adventures. Alan Byer's explorer spirit was ignited. In his imagination, he saw many prosperous and complex uninhabited planets being developed by him and his friends. During his adventures, he discovered special creatures, rubbed shoulders with the behemoths of the universe, fought to the death with alien pirates, and earned countless riches and honors. But now, he asked the sound array system to connect his voice so that the communicator could broadcast his words throughout the ship. He shouted sonorously and forcefully, All officers and sailors of the Bordero, the power of the highest heaven has invaded us. But do not be afraid. We need to understand that witchcraft is not an external force, but an internal one. As long as we are strong-willed enough, I, Alan Bayer, the Lord of Scotty, can lead you to victory, just like before. His voice was broadcast, and the major families inside the turbulent ship paused. They understood who the owner of the voice was and what those words meant. An imperial saint used his name to redeem them. Now, a man whose whole body was twitching shouted, The emperor has not abandoned us. His blazing flames, which could not be extinguished, even if the air was cut off before, 
began to weaken, and people who were shouting about their nightmares also came to life. Alan Bayer succeeded, and the Bordero became one of the few battleships in the fleet that maintained strong combat effectiveness. It orbited the fortress of Angeli and firmly broadcast Alan Bayer's voice. At this point, several approaching warships had their combat strength restored and became more stable. The voice of the Emperor's favor dispelled the spell. This was not because Alan Beyer was special, but because all the sailors fighting at this moment were serious. The Emperor's spokesperson was Alan Beyer, and they were willing to do anything for this man. The powerful Sector Lord sacrificed everything, including believing what he said, that he could resist the influence of the warp. Faith can only exert so much power. In a short period of time, many people's skin began to turn white, and some began to grow tiny horns. In the corners, the battleship's machinery began to grow flesh and blood, and the machine souls twisted from time to time. Error messages sounded, the meditator array was barely operating, and the priests and sages were constantly spreading spices and reciting prayers. Even so, it was like trying to bail water from a sinking ship with a bucket. The battleship reluctantly moved forward, and the shells still kept the heretic ships, led by the destruction ghost, from getting too close. An enraged Huron directly dialed the communication array of Garon Sulet. Normally, this communication array was just a decoration to express their equality, but now it was truly connected. Huron demanded angrily, Where is your witchcraft and magic power? Why do they still attack? If the gods you believe in and you have so many abilities, I have to wonder if you are more suitable to stay in the void. Garon Sulet, now extremely weak and tired, could only slowly spit out a few rough and vague words. But Huron heard the eight characters in them, forming two names, two familiar and displeasing names. He hung up the communication line, looked at the Imperial Navy in the distance with an interested expression, and asked his adjutant, Can I join a gang? The adjutant replied, The transport planes are ready anytime, anywhere, and we can fire a few smoke torpedoes as cover. We can be ready anytime, anywhere. Huron said, Call your best brothers and get on the ship. I'll go too. I want to solve a target. Choose that battleship as the place to join the gang. The adjutant asked doubtfully, That one? Boldero, Huron read out, word by word. I need to find a friend and settle the score. Chapter 398 In the Void Eternal Loneliness On the bridge of the Bordero ship, intermittent warnings came from the navigator who had barely regained his senses. He saw a red comet burning and approaching. Shortly after, the fire control team warned that the enemy had launched a transport ship along with several plasma torpedoes. Alan Bayer listened to the navigator's advice and a prophecy flashed through his mind. He always felt that such things were vain, but that night he had a sleepless conversation with a psyker lady. The ambiguous words in the tarot cards were now being realized one by one. He saw the burning planet and stepped over Scotty, which had become scorched earth. The prophecy was only half fulfilled. He believed he could break those curse-like words, but his brothers were usually there, and now, his shoulder was suddenly pressed, and his frown and gloomy face always attracted his brother's attention. Although the artificial skin was now sutured, Sergeant Katachan was still not as flexible as before. He didn't care about the unnatural wrinkles that appeared or the muscular texture that looked like it was inflating. He spoke bluntly. Boss, are you feeling uncomfortable? Alan Bayer replied. I don't, I won't, and I can't show it. I am now the core of the ship, the center of the union, the chain that connects everyone. The Master Chief retorted, That's why you can't do this. If the fire ignites from you, the entire fleet and the entire 600,000 people will die. You are the chain, and the flames will burn along your heart, consuming the entire fleet. And you, my friend, my brother, I am always here to serve the master of Scotty with my catachans. Alan Bayer asked again, But when the smoke of the war subsides, you need to return to the planet Catachan. To fulfill the promise of letting the lieutenant colonel return home in glory, so will everyone else. By then, I will have nothing but rights. He was worried. He was not a child, but he relied on the help of his brothers along the way. He was just a mortal. Although powerful, he could not defeat time and loneliness. The Master Chief knelt down on one knee and looked at his commander loyally. No matter what, 
I am still serving. I can't be sure about others, but I am here. When the trip is over, I will return to Scotty. No matter how violent the hurricane in the subspace is, no matter whether the time is ten years or a hundred years, even if you have gone to the tomb, I will come back. Alan Bayer sighed. The void is vast, and loneliness is eternal. But I still thank you for your comfort, my brother. From when we were crawling together in the trenches to now sitting in the center of the fleet, our relationship has not changed, and neither has the chief of staff, nor you. He sighed at his comrade. Among his few comrades, Katakin may have a closer relationship with him than the chief of staff. Because he is a soldier recognized by the lieutenant colonel, and because Master Chief Katachan is a real brother who has served alongside him to this day. They have faced countless monsters, nightmares, demons, filth, and aliens. As long as he is here, as long as he still fights for Alan Bayer's safety as a personal guard, he will be invincible. At this moment, the warlord looked into the endless emptiness of the void. In the darkness, there were flickering lights. Those were enemies, enemies of the Empire, his nightmare, the beginning and the end of everything. He needed to win. He shouted in a reassuring voice, just like usual. Close defense artillery team, fire control team, all brothers who can fire, shoot now, intercept the transport aircraft outside our armor, and let those who seek death perish in the endless cold of the void. I pray to the Emperor, we want our soldiers to fire without missing a beat. Explosive bombs, plasma, and all the firepower of the Moon-class ship formed a gorgeous barrage. The enemy's torpedo was instantly destroyed. The next second, a smoke screen exploded, obstructing the line of sight, and the targeting instrument, T, disappeared. Despite this, the intensive artillery fire continued, destroying several heavy transport aircraft. Huron stood in front of the observation window of the transport aircraft without any fear. Even as flashing plasma passed by his face, the warrior did not blink. He was certain that he was the chosen one. He could hear the promises made by the gods to him. He also knew that his life would not end before the Empire was exhausted. The corpse emperor would never disappear until the moment it dissipated. He was confident that he would not die until his long-cherished wish was fulfilled. He could bow to the gods and obey their promises, just to see this ridiculous empire fall to pieces. Therefore, he believed he would never die. Even if he was constantly on the battlefield, even if his body was seriously injured and his life was maintained by machinery, his willpower would not waver. He had become accustomed to being alone, fighting against the empire and the gods of chaos in the vast void. He didn't even trust his brother. He was used to this suffocating feeling. But his men were uneasy. They didn't want to die in the lonely void. Watching the gunfire graze the hull of the transport plane, even the most experienced couldn't help but want to turn to avoid the dense ballistic trajectories. But when he moved the steering wheel, Huron just shouted, I order you not to move. Just move forward through the smoke of fate. I swear we will arrive because the gods need it. He wasn't going to give those guys a break. If their promises were truly going to work, he had to remain unscathed. And just as his words and thoughts dictated, the projectiles seemed to deliberately avoid him. Under a thin layer of smoke, the gods controlled the probabilities of the mortal world. In that layer of dispensable smoke, the projectiles circled around him. As he moved forward, it was like a person bathing in heavy rain, but not a drop of rain fell on him. Here, where the wind of the warp blows, Huron was sure that the gods would help him. Just as he thought, the transport plane plunged into the bridge of the Empire's flagship. After a sudden tremor and vibration, the hot melt on both sides of the body drilled through the thick layer of adamantine in the roar of the machine soul. Beside him, his brothers stood up. The heavy infantry composed of centurions and terminators, a total of twelve veterans with long fangs and mutations, their years of service were astonishing. They came from all over the universe, but they had only one thing in common, loyalty to Huron. Those heavy, mecha-like warriors walked out from both sides to cover their master. The black armor of the Terminators was inlaid with skulls and trophies, and the silver-white elephant face stretched out long tusks. The Lord of the Red Pirates walked out of the passage sawed by the hot melt. They came to the core of the flagship and met Alan Bear face to face for the first time. 
In this lady made of adamantine, the roar of the machine souls, the sound of the equipment, and the trembling mortal sailors and officers hiding in the bunkers all made him laugh. Huron shouted loudly, Alan Bear, mortal hero, you did well, but it's over. From now on, from this moment on, everything you have will disappear. And I am magnanimous and can give you a chance. As a person who blindly believes in the Corpse Emperor, bring Scotty and this Star Zone to me. Believe in the gods and let the whole damn empire go to the grave together. I can give you the right to make your Star Zone an autonomous region and let you continue to be its lord. This is my last tolerance for the brave warriors. His voice was hoarse and terrible, but it shook people's souls. To be honest, many sailors and officers were thinking about giving him everything, as long as this killer didn't act on his threats. But, Alan Bayer shouted, Shut up, you heretic! Look at yourself! You use implants to prolong your life, you have nothing around you, and you serve the gods. Loyalty is no longer your fate, you don't believe in Ted, hem, let alone your brothers? Huron sneered. So what? The Empire is just a piece of rotten meat, and brothers are just helpers and allies. You and I have different ideas, so forget it. Fire! Captain, activate the defense system, Alan Bayer commanded. The private server's skull made a sizzling sound and the thinker roared. The captain pressed a button and four heavy wolf spider turrets emerged from the top of the ship and both sides of the control console, spitting fire. The officers on the ship also armed themselves with lasers and explosive bombs, engaging in a fierce firefight. The Red Corsairs were undeterred. They raised heavy boarding shields and planted them into the ground for cover. The monomolecular blades at the bottom of the shields pierced the adamantium layer. Simultaneously, several heavy storm bombs provided fire cover. Huron, wielding his explosive pistol, accurately blew off the heads of mortal officers one by one. Despite being a dying man reliant on implants, his shooting was terrifyingly precise. Each trigger pull claimed the life of an elite officer, staining the control panel with blood and unsettling everyone. The machine souls wailed in agony as the Red Corsair's Terminators hurled hot melt bombs to destroy the suppressing turrets. They were gaining the upper hand. Even as a large number of catacans and stormtroopers, guards of the Supreme Commander of the Empire, stormed the bridge with heat ray guns and hell guns, their firepower was insufficient against the heavy centurion armor. In such confined quarters, the super heavy armor had a significant advantage over the fragile mortals, though they were not invincible. Alan Bayer raised his pistol and fired a gravity bullet, hitting the center of the enemy formation. The Space Marines, equipped with magnetic boots, were unaffected by the gravity shift, but it was enough to disrupt their aim. In the next moment, several Catachons sacrificed themselves, raising hot melt weapons and exchanging their lives for the deaths of the Centurions and Terminators. The sizzling sound and flashing light dissipated, leaving four heavy Terminators melted. These veterans, who had fought on the front lines for a thousand years, were exchanged for the flesh and blood of mortals. Their souls would find solace before the Emperor, and their deeds would be sung on Terra. Huron advanced, pinning a catechin with a power claw, crushing his head and tossing the body aside, knocking over two more. He raised his explosive bomb and cleared the remaining forest warriors. He praised them bluntly. I knew their bravery and strength in Gondwa VI. Now they have only grown stronger. Such warriors earn my praise. If their level was insufficient, the warriors killed by them would be humiliated. But he was also furious. His guards had been killed. He ordered his soldiers to switch to power claws and charge. The Terminators displayed agility far beyond their size. Meanwhile, the Thinker array on the transport ship had already positioned the coordinates, and the rare and powerful transmission inside their armor was ready. In the next instant, the metal giants turned into flashing lights, reappearing next to the catacons and stormtroopers behind the bunkers. They tore the warriors into tiny, invisible molecules with their vibrating red claws. The most sensitive veteran among the mortals managed to deploy a hot melt bomb before dying, using his life to exact one final revenge on the minions of chaos. The bridge was a scene of chaos and carnage. The scene was now in ruins, with smoking turrets and minced meat everywhere. 
the consoles were littered with corpses, loyalists, invaders, catachans, stormtroopers, chaos traders. The last six surviving Terminator veterans raised their weapons and surrounded the remaining officers. This beheading strike had been extremely successful. Huron walked to the console and raised the communicator. He looked at the grill. As long as he controlled this place, the Empire would collapse. Many aliens and heretics had longed for this moment, but for Huron, the Chosen One, it was not enough. He turned to Alan Bear and spoke. Come on, mortal. King versus King. I know this is unfair, but it is the fairest option for you now. If you can defeat me, although the possibility is less than one in a thousand, my warriors will teleport me away because their core mission is to protect me. In other words, you just have to bring me to the brink of death, and this attack will disappear. If you do it, use your weapons, use your will against my power, then you will. Alan Bear thought subconsciously. Victory. Huron smiled. Yes, using the most primitive, great, and barbaric actions is my honor to you, a mortal who has resisted me several times. Rather than being killed by my brother, you would rather die with the grace of the Lord of the Red Pirates, wouldn't you? Come on, step onto the bridge, and I'll give you death. Alan Bayer stood up. He believed in this man, not because of anything else, but because this was Huron, because he was Luft Huron, the Lord of Badab. But he was pressed down by thick arms. There were still those who refused the proposal. It was Alan Bayer's personal guard, the most loyal and the last Kadashan. The Master Chief looked at Huron, then at his superior and raised his explosive blunderbuss at the Red Pirate King. Alan Bayer ordered him immediately, Stop! This is a duel! But the next second, the explosive gun was fired. The guard had betrayed the military order because his responsibility was to protect the Commander-in-Chief and the Lord of Scotty. In the following moment, the deflected halo on Huron threw away the projectile. He raised his hand, detonated the bomb, and gave death to this loyal warrior in the name of the monarch. Boom! Blood flew out, the head exploded, and Huron wiped the muzzle of his gun. He spoke to Alan Bayer again in an inviting tone. Come on, Lord Scotty, the duel is still valid. Avenge your captain of the bodyguard. Chapter 399, King vs. King Alan Bayer stroked the flesh and blood on his cheek, his emotions more numb than he had imagined. Rather than experiencing wild mood swings, he had already come to terms with the ruthless cruelty of the universe. He was indeed angry, but at this moment, his emotions couldn't save him, couldn't save Bordello, couldn't save Scotty, couldn't save the Sector. His military uniform was stained with the remains of his fallen comrades. He instructed the surviving soldiers to collect the Master Chief's body. He requested that, after the incident was over, the Master Chief be buried according to the highest standards of the ecclesiarchy in the Sector. His body would be preserved in a static position, using artificial skin and fillers to give him an intact head so that he would appear decent and loyal when kneeling before the emperor. As someone still alive today, this was the least he could do. The Master Chief's death was not meaningless. He had fulfilled his mission with due diligence. The Master Chief's behavior once again reminded Alan Bayer of his own responsibilities. He was the leader of the fleet, the Lord of Scotty, the one who resisted the irreversible power of chaos in the maelstrom. He was also the only person in the entire star region who must not fear Huron. He raised his weapon like the chief and walked to the deck, fulfilling his duty. The remaining officers, the captain of Bordelow, the veterans of the Red Pirates, and Huron were all watching him like actors in a stage play. Huron noticed that this mortal looked at him without anger or fear, only with calm resolve. At this moment, Alan Bear was so cold that it surprised even him, but he still walked down from his position, picked up the saber and the relic pistol, and addressed the Blackheart King. You are showing your temper. To your gods, you want to use such a duel to insult them, to prove your independence from their influence, to prove your value above others. You obviously don't believe in them, so why do you want to be their dog like this? Huron asked in surprise. How did you figure it out? Alan Byer replied, because we are the same kind of people. The Empire allows a mortal lord to control an entire star region because my lifespan is only 500 years, at most 800, 
and with constant war, no matter how much my life is extended, I estimate that I will only live to be 300 years old at most. A killer's bullet can easily put me to sleep. That's right. If you were not a space marine, you would have reached my level. You still worship the emperor from the bottom of your heart. You just can't stand this rotten empire. At the same time, you transfer those emotions to the lord of mankind. And you don't believe that those so-called gods can give everything for you. Huron laughed, his broken voice uttering a hoarse and vicious curse-like laughter. He was also covering up the fact that his heart had been seen through by Alan Bear. He shouted at the same time, I emphasize my proposal again. Let you control the entire sector, just like how the Empire treats you. You can pay me taxes, and I guarantee that you will not see any aliens or Imperial armies in your short life entering your territory. He once again put forward those sweet and seductive words. This was not a plea for mercy, but genuine admiration for this young man. If he could, he would try to let Garrod transform this mortal so that he could travel the universe with him and destroy the Empire. But Alan Baird just answered, This has nothing to do with me obeying you or the Empire. My fight is not to be anyone's dog, but to resist the power of chaos against the entire universe, the human race's endless swallowing. While you use warp energy to influence the war, we have already broken up and there is no possibility of cooperation anymore. If you were willing to talk to me like this before attacking the forest world, I might have accepted it, but now, I have inherited the wishes of countless mortal heroes throughout Te, He Sector. I want to prevent the power of chaos from invading here. No matter what I do or how many people I kill, I must ensure the entire sector continues to thrive. He was already like an overripe fruit, filled with his own ideas and concepts. Huron couldn't help but show a disappointed expression as he drew his blood-drinking sword. He fired at Alan Bear, and fire splashed everywhere. The loud noise of the explosive bomb was absorbed by the void shield, causing a frightening wave above Alan Bear's head, signaling the beginning of the duel. As a veteran of the Empire, Alan Bear immediately retreated into the nearest bunker, the command point of the bridge, which was a base made of fine gold beneath the large captain's seat. Huron advanced reluctantly, firing as he moved. The explosive bomb hit the base, revealing countless lines flowing with source power. The heat generated by the friction of the projectiles melted the skin of the lines. The source force sent out bursts of sparks, obscuring Huron's position from Alan Bear's view. The warlord rolled backwards nimbly, leaving the bunker, and simultaneously threw a fragmentation mine. The next second, the blood-drinking sword struck where he had just been, and the fragmentation mine exploded, cutting Huron's cheek. Huron asked, Why don't you use melt-a-bombs? Alan Bear, breathless, replied, If I use melt-a-bombs, you won't get close at all. You have a dangerous instinct like a beast. I can feel it. Huron couldn't help but laugh. He rarely felt like this during a fight, like two people playing chess, a pleasant game of combat. The last time he felt this way was on Badab with Asta of the Empire. It was time to fight. His huge power clamps grabbed the base shell and tore open a large piece of adamantine. Since explosive bombs were ineffective, he decided to try something else. After a squeaking and tearing sound that made one's head ache and ears sore, the huge hydraulic pliers held a half-meter-thick piece of fine gold and threw it. The wind caused by such a massive object was suffocating. Alan Bear raised his gun, used the melt mode to explode a piece, and got through. Bright red molten gold flowed on the outside of his carapace, and his characteristic red cloak began to burn due to the high temperature. At the same time, the melta gun fired at Huron. Huron raised his arm, which was burned by the heat, and the power clamp lost a big piece of it. At this point, both of them were in a sorry state. The veteran champions of the Red Pirates marveled that this mortal could fight with their master for so long, as in a real fight, they might not be able to play with their master like this. Only the wizard Garen Sulet was restless. He used the wind of subspace to sense what was happening. He predicted that this mortal would destroy everything. At this moment, the wizard was chanting a spell, trying to prevent any accidents. But the next second, five beams of flames flashed through his mind simultaneously. The strongest one was silver, which made his eyes sting. The second was red, which dried up his heart. 
then green and blue, making his joints ache and his mind numb. Finally, purple, the mere sight of which made his blood circulate faster. He huddled up in his room, whining in pain. He realized that this battle had been recognized by the gods. As part of the destiny of the universe, it had become the core of the gods' chessboard. To use a chess metaphor, it was a long game. In the game, the last few moves are the most important, determining the winner. Big moves. Yes, destiny had come to this. At this crucial crossroads, the great powers had recognized the resistance of these two arrogant mortals to their own destiny, using the most honorable and original method to determine the human empire's peace and stability for thousands of years in the last hundred years. In these 40,000 years, everything will be decided here. At this moment, the black-hearted king no longer wants to play. He must focus and win to prove his worth. Alan Bayer must also go all out, not just to survive, but to ensure his brothers escape from the grim war. The two men raised their weapons and circled each other like lions, searching for any vulnerabilities on the deck. The air, circulated hundreds of times, had almost solidified. In the end, it was the younger Alan Bayer who chose to launch his projectiles, gravity bombs. A dark, rippling vortex exploded next to Huron, crushing his internal organs through his armor like a small black hole. He had suffered from this before, and several of his veterans had died because of it. However, he relied on the magnetic boot's adsorption force to easily escape the gravity that would be fatal to mortals. The next moment, Alan Bayer stabbed with his saber, forcing Huron to use his blood-drinking sword to parry. The two magical weapons clashed, producing a buzzing sound. Huron, stronger, slowly pushed his weight forward. Even with the gravitational help of the gravity bombs and the brute strength of the green skins, Alan Bayer, a mortal lord, was still far behind a true space marine. Huron finally laughed uncontrollably. He enjoyed this feeling, hanging by a thread so evenly matched. It made him forget the pain caused by his implants and that he was already half dead. His hoarse, crazy laughter seemed to be extremely difficult for Alan Bear to bear. So far in the battle, Alan Bear had not gained any advantage. He had to admit that this king was more powerful than any heretic or alien he had ever faced. More powerful than the Eldar Archon, the green-skinned warlord, or the traitorous Inquisitor. Sweat poured from Alan Bear's forehead. The destructive power of his saber began to weaken. He rarely used duels to win wars, and now his shortcomings were revealed. Perhaps in troop formation, he could beat Huron. In operations and winning hearts, he was evenly matched with Huron. But in terms of combat power, even when he went all out, it was just a pleasure for Huron. He almost gave up. The power of the gravity bomb began to weaken, but Huron became more excited and powerful. Alan Bayer couldn't think of how he could win until a surprising shot from a primitive world flintlock pistol fired on the ship. A primitive lead bullet, so weak that even the gods didn't care, couldn't even scratch Huron's original skin. The person who fired it didn't expect it, nor did Captain Bordeaux, who took it casually in desperation. Yet this souvenir made a significant impact in this existential moment for humanity. The lead bullet, sank into the breathing port of Huron's implant, blocking his oxygen supply. Although a space marine's physique doesn't require much oxygen, Huron's breathing port was exerting force, inhaling strongly. The lead bullet was sucked into the implant, causing Huron a moment of stinging pain. Normally this feeling would be negligible, but at this moment, facing this mortal lord, Huron's casual attitude cost him. He reached out to cut off his breathing port and remove the lead bullet, but Alan Bear saw the opportunity. He let go of his saber, allowing the blood-drinking sword to penetrate his abdomen. At the same time, he took out the relic pistol and used its maximum melta power to strike the horrific wounds Huron had sustained during the Battle of Badab. In an instant, a lose-lose situation emerged. Alan Bear stood there with his internal organs spilling out of his abdomen. The bright red blood-drinking sword penetrated his body and was pulled out by Huron at the same time. Huron's uniform turned red as a secondary wound caused his implants to melt into hot molten lava. He roared in agony, his life support equipment failing. Under normal circumstances, he would have died within half a minute. But this was Luft Huron, the black-hearted Huron, tyrant and blood reaver of Badab, a traitor, heretic, and abandoned warlord. 
he was stubborn and refused to die. In his delirium, he saw a wall made of countless blades. His will seemed to pass through it, relishing the sensation of being cut into pieces. In the real world, veteran red pirates quickly embraced him and B began to set coordinates. The next second, Huron collapsed onto the floor of the teleportation room aboard the Ghost of Destruction. He was weak, frantically sucking air into his lungs, feeling as if he might suffocate. His armor was overloaded from traveling through the warp. It is generally believed that only those wearing Terminator armor can be effectively teleported and survive, but Huron could travel deeper into the subspace. He knew he would not die, which is why he dared to propose a duel. Meanwhile, Garrod, who had been rescued, was being treated by a skilled apothecary working to stabilize his master's wounds. Despite their efforts, the command system of the Red Pirates collapsed, and their aggressive battleships began to retreat, announcing yet another victory for Alan Bear. But now, Alan Bear stood in a pool of blood, his willpower waning. He saw the silver sun shining on him, cold and devoid of warmth. He asked the towering presence if he could return, feeling as though he had not completed his mission. The Lord of Mankind remained silent, always unpredictable. Alan Bear had always thought he was the closest to the Emperor, but he was wrong. Except for Malkador, the wise man never showed his vulnerability to anyone again. In the real world, Alan Bear was carried into a quiescent position by the guards. Governor Pan Lan, the biological sage, had just completed resuscitation surgery on the three surviving heroic crew members. He arrived in a hurry, his mechanical legs almost on fire. There were no Skatarii around him, who should have been protecting him. He had come in a shuttle, which had already taken up a lot of time. He looked at the mortal hero who had been completely penetrated. The mechanized display glowed red and kept flashing. He raised his third hand and said emotionlessly, There is no more chance. The internal organs are destroyed on a large scale. The efficiency of the heart is less than 2%. The area of brain death is controllable. Calculation complete. The probability of success is 0.5%. The operation begins and I will do my best. Chapter 400 In the Name of Scotty Time has become the most precious commodity in this world. Within three days, a large amount of materials were imported, ranging from the most revolting alien healing potions to the most expensive resurrection medicines. Only tens of thousands of bottles remain in the galaxy today. These came from ancient times, developed by human civilization as biological life-extending agents. Dozens of mechanical priests worked tirelessly, day and night, to maintain the life of the master who ruled the entire sector, even as their eye indicators began to malfunction. The Red Pirates have retreated. They managed to save their pharmacist, but they will likely remain inactive for a long time. During Huron's severe injury, Onius Pry, a former member of the Red Scorpion chapter, led a rebellion against a large number of Astartes brothers. He formed a new rebel Astartes force in the Maelstrom, further diminishing the remaining Red Corsair forces. Huron's wounds may take a long time to heal, but they have already identified a new target, a rich technological world. In a few hundred years, the Red Pirates may rise again. The outlook for Alan Bear's surgery is grim. A large amount of subspace energy has embedded itself in his chest, a problem even the advanced technology of the Gene Sage cannot resolve. Although Huron did not use armor-piercing and penetrating weapons, he chose the more insidious blood-drinking sword. For a mortal, such a curse would be fatal countless times over. Alan Bear's physique is extraordinary, and his willpower is strong. Moreover, his soul is not a common human soul, but one from the ancient Terra era, close to soulless. This low subspace projection even has a certain ability to dampen subspace fluctuations, helping him alleviate the pain. Meanwhile, Panlan's founding governor has been relentless. Facing the benefactor who once saved his world, he uses his cold fingers and highly replaceable body to employ various implants, resurrection potions, and even some embryos derived from Zerg cells to rebuild the man's body. Like a mother restuffing a torn ragdoll, he takes on the responsibility of using machinery and surgery to reconstruct and regenerate a person. Outside his studio stands Scotty's captain, Tadashi Academy, the Chief of Staff, the Rattling Ratman, Inquisitor Nova of the Inquisition, Governor John, the Captain of the Bordeaux, and everyone else connected to him. 
They blame themselves for not being at Alan Bear's side during his most dangerous moment, just as he had been there for them when they needed a hero the most. Reflecting on Alan Bear's long experience and career, it was but a fleeting moment in the grand timeline of the galaxy and the vast empire. His defeat of Huron bought the empire precious time. Countless unknown events have transpired in this galaxy. Even so, he remains great. It has nothing to do with whether he is the original body or whether he can change the empire. For all the breathing humans in this sector, today's dilapidated and grueling daily life is a struggle. The lords who risk their lives to protect these things are the people closest to the emperor in their eyes. In Angeli Port, the nobles who received news of the victory began to organize civilians to pray for this great man. Millions of people in the entire roaming port ceased working and transporting. In the massive Anglican church, the square next to the church, or even in the blocks near the square, they prayed for this lord's recovery, kneeling before the emperor and the Aquila. Passing transport ships, fleets of the Imperial Navy, and members of the metal void ships also set up shrines in their own metal worlds. They smeared their skin with a fragrance mixed with ship engine oil and asked their metal deities for Alan Bayer's recovery. Mother, the great ship engine, the soul can pray for this gentleman. Exactly five days later, the operation was completed. Alan Bear, who was sealed in a stasis pod, could still only maintain the lowest vital signs. The sage proposed to send High, M, back to Scotty. In any case, even if he died, he could not be left as a lonely soul in the void. Surprisingly, it was not Alan Bear's comrades who were most devastated by this news. The most unexpected reaction came from the beautiful Inquisitor Nova, whose emotional turmoil exceeded that of the other Imperial Astra Militarum brothers who showed sadness. For them, the Master Chief had left, and the heroic brothers of Destruction Eagle were also unconscious. The war had taken away many things, and they had long been prepared for such losses. But for Nova, this lady, she only had Alan Bear, and she also loved Alan Bear. Compared to the unfamiliar Imperial Guards, Imperial Navy, and Voidport, she only loved this Lord's office. There was a so-called souvenir, so before she left this sector due to responsibility, she decided to follow Alan Bear back to his hometown, Scotty. Bordero set sail again, taking his master with him through the void. When they saw the planet and the star again, it had been two years. They passed by Launder and walked through the void fortress. After half a month of returning to Scotty, the subspace navigation was unexpectedly smooth, as if the Emperor was also escorting them. Amidst a burst of subspace fluctuations and purple ripples caused by Geller's stance, Bordero, this lady, tore apart reality. The curtain of the universe came to Scotty, which was as beautiful as ice gems. This planet is not very beautiful. It was once beautiful, but now it is cold. However, for the Scotty people, this is their only home planet. On the day of their return, Alan Bear was placed on the Lamanus tank. On the road, in the eyes of all the residents of this world, he walked towards his fortress. Among them was an extraordinarily tall giant who was bringing a young lady with him who looked at his frozen face in the crowd. Some people knelt on the ground and prayed to Alan Bear, some cried loudly, saying that there would never be such a governor again and more people were confused about how Scotty should spend the long time in this dark galaxy. Next, the second lieutenant assumed the responsibility of planetary governor. He and his wife became veritable military aristocrats. There was no problem with the safety of the fortress world Scotty, but the strategy once proposed by Alan Bear, which united several neighboring star sectors, could not be executed by this young man due to his lack of ability or reputation. He was anxious because of this, and the vast resources in the entire sector once again fell into stagnation. The planetary governor was disobeying his orders. The arrogance and greed of those nobles were amazing. Even in the face of the warriors who had just saved them, they showed stinginess. Maybe they were just like Ling. According to the tribe's evaluation of human beings, human beings are always short-sighted, stupid, and unable to find their own path. During this period, Judge Nova completed the packaging of Alan Bear's biography and sent it to the tribunal she belonged to. She also used this excuse to stay in this world as much as possible. She must have her own memories of this hero. 
although her responsibility prevents her from revealing it, the blonde Valhalla beauty often observes the appearance of Alan Bear in the holy room where the stasis pod is placed, and he is as lifelike as yesterday, working with the subspace curse. Nova could only watch as the great psyker, the Inquisitor, fought. Others, such as the Chief of Staff who graduated from Tadashi Academy, chose to leave here and began traveling around the galaxy. The Eagles of Destruction built metal coffins and fearless mechas for the awakened Master Chief. The Letling Boy became a palace chef and served former soldiers everywhere, providing food to those who came to worship. None of these positive developments could overshadow the troubling issue at hand, the abnormal energy fluctuations in Alan Bear's wounds. A part of the subspace curse had infiltrated his flesh and blood, rendering him unconscious. During this period, his willpower had been in constant resistance. As his body began to recover, his willpower grew stronger. Alan Bear, a hero highly sensitive to subspace energy, had always exhibited a strong resistance to it. If anyone knew his origins, they might attribute this resistance to his ancient Terran lineage, from an era before humans awakened to psychic powers. Pure-blood humans of that time had energy states similar to low-spirited titans. This characteristic had helped him survive many ordeals. Even now, as a second lieutenant in an aristocratic uniform approached his coffin, Alan Bear remained as still as he had been the previous day. The second lieutenant, looking exhausted, had taken on the role of governor for a year. He felt overwhelmed by the numerous plans left by Alan Bear. Despite his desire to complete those grand narratives, he lacked the capability. Sitting at the stand, he muttered to himself, Boss, you've left a lot of mess, and there's a judge who acts like a little widow, but you've always been like this, and you're very lucky. He continued, Corporal, clean the toilet. Use white phosphorus to clean the bodies of those space marine traitors. You always ordered me around like this, and it's the same now. By the way, I'm now a major general of the Imperial Guard and the governor of Scotty Planet Fortress. You can't order me anymore, boss. As he muttered, he raised his head to see Alan Bear's eyes open, staring at him. After a year, Alan had barely defeated the curses, and the first person to greet him was not his brother or sisters, but this complaining subordinate. If he had the strength, he would have scolded this little villain. Alan Bear gently opened his mouth and said, Second Lieutenant, no, Major General. The Major General immediately leaned in, eager to hear his boss's words. What did you say? he asked. Alan Bear, weak but clear, replied, Go and wipe the decks of the Bordeaux for a day. The Major General, relieved, responded, It's okay, you can take as many days as you want, boss. He then announced to everyone present that the Lord of Scotty had returned. In the following months, Alan Bear began his rehabilitation exercises, which took him half a year. During this time, he started addressing various issues, such as adding more fortresses, preparing winter food for the Scotty people, and calculating the expansion plans of the Red Pirates. His vast defense network and the Alliance of Stars were also being launched with him at the center. He also faced Judge Nova's feelings for him, but they never married. Both held high positions and could not be bound by such commitments. However, rumors persisted that no matter how busy he was, the judge would always find time to return to Skadi and stay for a while. After truly securing the star sector, its prosperity matched his predictions. It was comparable to 500 small worlds. Countless imperial worlds could exchange materials more reasonably, help each other, and even achieve a certain level of integration. Alan Bear often traveled around the world on the Bordeaux, dealing with chaos pollution, executing disloyal noble warlords, and delegating a large number of government affairs to local authorities. He granted each world enough autonomy and used his personal charm and force to bind them together. However, this approach had a drawback, idolatry. Alan Bear understood that he could ensure peace in this sector as long as he was alive, but he also felt the lingering curse of Huron within him. He had to accept that nothing in this world was perfect. He had become a noble and needed a name. He chose the name from the world of Scotty and changed his name to Alan Bear Cady. After experiencing life and death, adventure, and war, most of the organs of this powerful imperial hero were replaced with implants. He also gained the true name of Scotty and countless rights. 
In a cold winter in the fortress world of Scotty, he hosted all his relatives, friends, and noble guests, announcing two significant things with unique Anjali cuisine and grand pomp. The first an announcement was that his family would be named Scotty. The Scotty family would be the eternal planetary governors of this world. He requested the governors of the entire sector to sign a document recognizing this fortress world on a vital transportation route. This world would always belong to the Scotty family, and in return, the family would bear all responsibilities to protect it. The second announcement was that he had a child. He did not disclose who the mother was, but those familiar with him could guess. For many governors, this young man who appeared out of nowhere was enviable. He was born at the pinnacle of power in the entire sector, into a prosperous and famous family, which also made people worry. This young man would have to live up to the great achievements created by his father. At the same time, he needed to find ways to protect the world and had the responsibility to unite hundreds of worlds in the entire sector. Such a heavy responsibility is not something that ordinary people can handle and the hereditary system. They could only hope that the son of Scotty would inherit his father's bravery and be fortunate enough to survive any chaotic situation. But Alan Bear was not worried. The world ruled by his brothers and his family would become a core of power. According to his plan, the entire alliance would help each other and form a fortress as strong as a chain, stabilizing the situation in the sector. For the people of the Pangaea and Gondva sectors, this lord's rule was benevolent and fertile. For the empire, the influx of large amounts of supplies and the reinforcement of the maelstrom's defenses also brought a sense of ease and happiness. In this way, a small legend came to an end in a thousand years of darkness. Final remarks. It's been a year, and it's hard to imagine how much I've gone through to finish writing this work. The most difficult part wasn't the plot or the characters, but the passion that makes people feel pain and consumes your soul. Yes, passion. When you do something you love countless times, the relationship can become as crushing as newlyweds turning into an old couple. There were many times when I had no inspiration and still needed to write. I admit that I struggled with the mentality, plot, and characters. There is a lot of naivety and stupidity in it, but it is nothing compared to the dissipation of enthusiasm. I actually thought that I should end it after retaking Scotty, but I personally felt that doing so would not be complete. As for the death of the characters in my stories, I actually try to avoid it most of the time. But in this cruel world, for a man with pure faith and will like a warrior, I can't persuade him to stop. This is not within my control. Regarding the new book, I will try to start it as soon as possible. Although no one may read it, my idea is to write a story similar to Rogue Trader, discarding the war narrative in the plot and replacing those endless stories with adventure and Cthulhu-style warp pollution. War might still be inevitable, though. I think the protagonist may be Alan Bear's child. In my imagination, the protagonist has a blood factor similar to what rogue traders value most. Otherwise, why could Alan Bear initiate Scotty's research on the rebels for so long? A fortress that he hasn't completely mastered yet? He is actually a descendant of a noble who existed in the 30k era. Although his bloodline is thin now, he still found the key to open the fortress, a necklace, near Scotty, his family's home planet. In general, I will try to use a more mature narrative style to create a new adventure for the new story. The protagonist will plunge into the depths of the maelstrom to regain the former honor of his family. In a dark place where even the Emperor's light cannot shine. He will travel through the chaotic vortex of the warp, with the Bordero remaining his flagship. Summary, Cthulhu style, adventure, Warhammer flavor, rogue trader, family blood, alien slaves, and more slaves. Follow-up update. The new book has been released, Warhammer Free Captain, for the Emperor and Eldar Slaves. Preface. The editor expressed some concerns about the internal investment. To be honest, the writing in this book is a bit more hardcore than usual. In general, I had to beg him to sign off on it. Sigh. Book title, Warhammer Free Captains. Synopsis. It is the 41st millennium of mankind, and for over a hundred centuries, the Emperor has sat motionless on Earth's golden throne, 
the ordained master of all mankind by the will of the gods and the infinite armies. He is the ruler of millions of conquered worlds. A remnant of a bygone era, he has been struggling in the invisible energy since the age of dark technology. A thousand souls are sacrificed every day to sustain the corrupt monarch of this empire, ensuring he never truly dies. However, even in such a decaying empire, there is still a need for explorers who can traverse the stars. When the Lord of Mankind still walked the earth, the trade licenses issued by him created ancient and vast merchant dynasties, opening up countless new worlds. Now, in this dark age of the 41st millennium, the powerful descendants of those pioneers use their own adventures to stir up new bloody storms within the empire. Will they become new legends and shape the future, or will they be toyed with by the gods of the warp and ruined by evil laughter? In this era, there is no room for hesitation.